Welcome to CSI Coats Film. This is part two of a two-part program on types of evidence. Today we're focusing specifically on physical evidence. In a news program, have you ever been asked this question, have you seen this person? Consider the following. Consider that they are five foot ten inches, person's male, wears a gray hooded sweatshirt, a gray cap, blue jeans, and red athletic shoes. How rare do you think that person would be in, for example, your high school campus? Today in this program, we're going to consider the value of physical evidence, types and examples of physical evidence, as well as an important distinction that we need to make about physical evidence, and that is class versus individual evidence. We'll consider these together. First, the value of physical evidence. Generally, physical evidence is considered more reliable than physical evidence. You may wonder why. Well, it's consistently measured. It can prove that a crime has been committed. It can corroborate or refute the testimony that someone gives in court. It can also establish the identity of persons associated with the crime. And plays a role in reconstructing the events of a crime as well. Now, what do we mean by types of physical evidence? Well, there's transient evidence. In other words, it's temporary. These are normally only seen by the responding officer to the call. So it's very important that as that officer goes through that crime scene for the very first time, what that officer sees, smells, hears, is going to be critical because it's the only time these things are going to be observed. So. It's very important to record those events. Next, pattern evidence produced by direct contact between a person and an object or between two objects. Conditional evidence is produced by a specific event or action. It's important in crime scene reconstruction and in determining the set of circumstances or sequence within a particular event. Next, transfer evidence. In other words, it's produced between contact between persons or objects between persons and persons. And then associative evidence. In other words, something that you would associate with a particular victim or suspect of the crime scene. For example, the personal belongings, a set of car keys, or even items in their wallet, such as their license. Now, always keep in mind the evidence triangle. When we're, considering, when we're considering physical evidence, we're trying to make a connection between these three corners of the evidence triangle. The arrows here represent physical materials or objects that we can link the victim and suspect and crime scene together. Now, what are some examples of these different types of evidence that I just mentioned? First, there's transient evidence. What would be some examples of that? Well, as I said, they're observed by the responding officer. Could be an odor that's in the room or the location. Could be the temperature of that location. Imprints or indentations that are on surfaces that may disappear in a short time, given wind and rain, if it's raining out could destroy that evidence immediately. So, it must be captured. How about some examples of pattern evidence, like tire treads? Were the tires new or were they worn? Very important. Burn patterns in an arson crime. The position of the furniture in a room. Material damage that was done, for example, in breaking and entering. Tool marks that were left in the process of a crime. Gunpowder residue that's found on the victim's body or on the suspect's hands. Body position, particularly when we find a decedent that's died for the number of hours they've been left there, there's something known as lividity. In other words, the collection of blood on the lower extremities uh, of that person showing the position they were lying in. Now, if those collections of blood are at a different location other than the bottom of the victim, it's very likely that body was moved. So body position is very important in establishing the sequence of a crime. Perhaps there's an, an additional crime scene that needs to be investigated. Perhaps the body was moved. Tire marks and skid marks, as I said as well, are also pattern evidence. 
And next we want to take a look at conditional evidence. Here is a list. The position of a light switch, whether the lights were turned on or off, whether a window was open or closed, locked, and so forth. Smoke. That's at the crime scene, its color, the direction of travel, how dense it was, and its odor. Fire, the color of the flame, the spread of the flames, the speed of that spread, the temperature and direction of the fire. These can also be very important aspects of physical evidence here grouped as conditional evidence. And then location, the location of injuries or wounds, blood stains, of the victim's vehicle, of weapons, cartridge cases, or of broken glass. In other words, these are all contingent upon the actions of some person, whether it's the victim or the suspect. And then more about conditional evidence. What about vehicles? Were those vehicle doors, were they locked or were they unlocked? Were the windows open or closed? Was the radio on or off? What was the odometer mileage? And again, the position of a person's body, the wounds, rigor, liver, or algae mortis as well. And the scene, the condition of the furniture, the doors and windows, any disturbances or signs of a struggle, these are all secondary to the actions of people, whether it's the victim or the suspect or a combination of those. And then next, a very important distinction we need to make is between class and individual evidence. Consider the following. Here we have a piece of fabric taken from a garment. Can we trace those fibers directly back to this garment? Or could they belong to all class of garment? What about the broken glass pieces that you see at the bottom of the screen? Can they be traced back to only one bottle? Now, when we look at the fibers that you see here, these fibers are class evidence because there's no way that we could determine if they came from this particular garment, as similar as they may appear. There may be plenty other garments that these could match just as well. However, you guessed it, yes, the glass fragments that are from this broken glass, they can fit exactly together like pieces of a puzzle. And so therefore, when we look at the difference between class and individual evidence, we're only looking at one source for individual evidence. It only comes from one source. Class evidence, it could come from a variety of different sources, even though they may have something in common. Now, let's get some practice right now. Make a list of the pictures that you see below me right now. The matchbook, the duct tape, the shoe print that you see right here, the tear in this paper, as well as the picture of the skull. Which of these do you think could be individual evidence. Think about it for a minute. Did you make your list? These matches are going to be individual evidence. The reason why is because the tears at the bottom of these matches are going to perfectly match the complementary tears that we find inside the match. Now, why would I say class evidence? Well, we have a piece of tuck, duct tape that's that's cut off the roll and it all is going to depend upon whether this cut right here whether it was done with a sharp knife or whether it was torn if it was torn the argument can be made that, that would be individual evidence because very rarely would a tear be made twice in the same way off the same roll but as it appears it's class evidence because the cut is clean Again, a shoe pattern here could be individual, or it could be class. Can you see why it could be either way? How about how worn that shoe was that produced the print? Perhaps there's cuts and damage that's revealed on this print. There's also a wear pattern. And so if this is in a pattern from an old worn shoe, that's going to be individual. But if it's a brand new shoe, it's going to be class evidence. Make sense? And then let's move on to this tear out of the paper. Very much like the matchbook, if we have a complementary pattern of tears right here, where they perfectly match, 
that's going to indicate that this little fragment of paper came from no other piece of paper than the one that you see pictured here. So, you guessed it, those paper fragments are individual evidence. Why? Again, one source. All right, and the same thing with the bones that are found in this skull. Not everyone's suture lines where you can see these bones growing together are going to be exactly identical. And so that pattern in where these joins are together, remember these are called sutures, you'll need to know that later on, they're considered individual evidence. Hey, if you got them all right, you're on the right track, good job. And then we move on. Remember at the top of the segment, I asked you this question, have you seen this person? Let's bring him back again. Here, I'll get myself out of the way again. Under 5'10", male, gray hooded sweatshirt, gray cap, blue jeans, red athletic shoes. Is this combination common or rare? What do you think? Now, you're probably thinking these are all class evidence. There are many people that enter under 5 foot 10. Many people, of course, are male. Many people have gray hoodies, gray caps, blue jeans, red athletic shoes. And so you're all correct when you're thinking this is class evidence. Could we possibly use, however, this combination to trace this combination of characteristics of a person back to one source? So the more class evidence we have, you can see it strengthens what we call the probative value of that evidence. Do you recall what probative means? It means it's the ability to prove something. Now, we're going to examine this using some statistics. Let's say that we're looking for a suspect that matches the description that I just gave you, and he's on your high school campus. We'll walk into a classroom along with a police officer, and let's say that we have 26 students that are in that class. We're gonna take a sample to see actually how common these particular features of our description are on this campus. So, if we have 12 people on that class out of 26, that are under 5 foot 10, we'll simply take that number 12 and divide that by 26, and we're going to get a ratio of 0.46. We'll do the same for the remainder of these attributes. In that class of 26, as I was saying, there's 14 males. Six people have gray hoodies, one person has a gray cap, four of the people in the class have red athletic shoes. And keep in mind, the campus has a population of around 2,100 students. How many people on the campus, taking all this information together, are going to match the very description we have? Do you think it's more than five? Do you think it's more than 100? Well, let's take a look. Based upon our sample, this is what we have. We're going to take each of these ratios, and we're going to multiply them against each other, and then times our population of 2,100. Now keep in mind, all these values are less than one, aren't they? That means that as we multiply them against each other, the product is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller still. And then we'll multiply it times 2,100. Take a moment, do you think it's more than five people? Well. Our product is 0.71, or approximately one person. Isn't that surprising? A simple description that can be very useful in a television program that the police release to the media, or that we use here on campus somewhere, can be used in greatly narrowing down persons of interest. And so here is the real power of class evidence we can rule out a suspect. If they don't match the description, they're off the list. It can also be used in conjunction with other class evidence and circumstantial evidence to narrow the focus of the investigation. And it's useful in identifying these persons of interest as I just demonstrated to you now. Make sense? Now, in closing, consider the following. First, 
I'd like you to come up with a scenario just like the one you viewed and have a friend solve for the number of suspects. See how close the two of you came to your answer. And then next, consider this question. What has more probative value, individual or class evidence? Can you explain why? And thirdly, from the pages of history, back in 1994, the first O.J. Simpson trial, prosecutors pointed out that the defendant owned a rare Italian shoe brand that was only sold in New York City, which matched those that were found uh, in the bloody trail at the crime scene. Keep in mind, O.J. Simpson and the crime scene were both in Los Angeles. Would those Italian shoe prints, would they have high or low probative value? And was this evidence ignored by the jury? And as always, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.